Hello and welcome everybody to the first uh, lecture in introduction uh, to research methods. So in this lecture, we're going to give you an introduction into the course and also an introduction to research. So just to uh, give you an idea, my name is Martin Schweinberger. Um, I'm course coordinator for Slot 706. And regarding information about the course, if you have any questions, the most important point where you can look is uh, the uh, ECP, so the course profile, right? So all the information that you need is in the ECP. Um, the platform that we're going to use to share information with you or where you find all the resources, links to assessments, information about assessments is on UQ Learn, so the UQ instance of Blackboard. And we're also going to share the script with you, but it's still being developed, so be a little patient. All right. So as I already mentioned in the uh, orientation week welcome message, the broad aim of this course is to introduce you to research in the language sciences or in the language studies. And the specific aims of this course are to make you understand the nature and the process of research. How does research work, right? What are key components? To make you comprehend aspects and components of research methodology. Also, what are different types of approaches or methodologies in research? Um, we want to enable you to be able to review, analyze, and synthesize secondary sources, because that's really important when you do any type of research. We also want you to be uh, able to design and present a research proposal, so your idea for basically a study. And we want you to be able to identify, locate, and use materials relevant for your academic interests. So that's basically the specific aims of this course. Now. With regard to today's lecture, um, the first part will be about the course. So we'll basically check the ECP. Um, just to give you an idea what it looks like, we're going to have a look at the class structure and assessments. And the second part of this, uh, the lecture is about, um, well, research, right? How does it work? Uh, what's the difference between different forms of research? What's the research process? And maybe also uh, give you a little bit of guidance on how to choose a research topic, but we'll actually um, go into more depth uh, in that in uh, the week two lecture. All right, so information about the course. So this course is a flipped classroom approach, which means that it has online and face-to-face -face components. So the lectures are delivered online which means that uh, basically you can watch them at home at your own speed, right? Um, they are made available uh, via Blackboard or UQLearn. And uh, you are expected to have watched the lectures before the tutorials, right? Um, also, we'll provide you with uh, the slides and the notes um, of uh, each lecture. Then we have readings. They're also made available to you um, on UQ Learn, so on the Blackboard instance. The readings are also online and you're expected to read them before the tutorial. There are required readings, uh, but also there are optional readings and we consider them to be relevant. So if you want to delve deeper into a topic or know more, then you're invited to also uh, read the um, non-obligatory, so not essential, but additional readings. Now, a key component of the course uh, are the tutorials, which are on-site and face-to-face. -face. So while the lecture is online, the tutorials are face-to-face. -face. And the tutorials are essentially practice sessions, um, and we only make them available upon request. So if you, for example, have an excuse for not showing up, you can basically tell us in advance, and then we'll record the session, and we'll make that link specifically available to you. But you need to make us aware that uh, we need to record it. Again, all resources for the tutorial slides, handout exercises will be made available to you on Blackboard. In addition to that, we also have additional materials. And again, we make them available to you via UQL and Blackboard, right? So all resources above that are essential uh, are essential for successful assessment completion. So. Uh, everything that we do in the course is relevant for the assessments, but also additional materials. They are um, more in-depth in uh, assessment preparation, right? But also uh, just more information about the course content of each lecture or also the tutorials. 
When it comes to the course components, there are four components. As I said, the lecture, which is online, right? So they're basically, I introduce a topic and I talk about a topic. Uh, then we have the tutorials, which are on site. And there we do activities and we do discussions about the lecture content or also uh, the readings. So the readings are also another component. Um, so as we said, there's obligatory and suggested readings and they're all provided on QQ Blackboard. And finally, there's the assessments. And the assessment um, as assessments essentially test um, what you've learned in the course or in the resources and let you apply uh, what you've learned to specific uh, issues or um, uh, topics. Again, all assessments are available via UQ Blackboard. So with this course, we have uh, four key aspects. The first is that we really want to introduce you to research methodology with the specific focus, of course, on the language sciences. Um, so that includes linguistics, applied linguistics, multilingual studies, second language uh, acquisition research, and uh, language learning and teaching. So it's really just to give you a um, comprehensive understanding of what are key aspects of doing research in these areas. The second aspect is more practical. It's basically that we want to endow you with the basic skills needed to plan and carry out various types of postgraduate research, ranging from course papers uh, to the dissertation. So we really want to give you practical skills that you can apply then in your own academic life. The third aspect is really the topics um, that basically we've included in this course. So the topics examine, uh, examined here uh, include the nature of research, research quality and planning, honesty and ethics in research, developing a research topic and a literature review, um, preparing, developing and presenting a research proposal and critical reading and writing skills. So it's really from the very basics to basically being able to write up um, your own research. And the fourth aspect is, of course, the assessments, which provide you an opportunity to apply these skills in relevant research tasks. Just in terms of the activities that we're going to uh, go over in the coming weeks. So as I said, in week one, it's just an introduction to the course and to research. In week two, we're going to focus on conceptualizing a research project. So how do you start, right? How can you conceptualize it? What, what do you want to do when you do uh, your own research? Then designing your research project, right? So how do you design it? What do you need to uh, consider? What are different components of research? Then we're going to have a look at qualitative research, uh, which is one aspect it's more an interpretative approach to analyzing data. Then we're going to have a look at quantitative research. What does quantitative research do? How does it differ from qualitative research? And what advantages uh, does it have? Then in week six, we're going to talk about presenting and analyzing data, because presenting and analyzing data is really a key skill that you need when you work with data and when you want to um, basically do your own research. Then we're going to focus more on reading and writing research effectively. This is actually a topic that will pop up over and over again in the different sections, because it's really key to doing any kind of research. Um, in week eight, we're going to talk about research ethics and academic integrity, um, which is also very important. So things that you need to consider when you want to um, basically collect data from people. How do you do that ethically? What do you need to take into account? How can you apply for ethics? Um, and also, what is just good practice, good ethical practice? For example, when it comes to referencing and avoiding plagiarism, right? In week nine, we're going to talk about specific approaches to um, research of text and talk. So how do you um, basically do research on data that represents either uh, speech or talk um, or text, right? In week 10, we have a section on action research in language classrooms. Um, so action research is something that's very applied. It's very down to earth and it's very useful for teachers. So it's really uh, a little bit separate of uh, fundamental research or applied research that we do otherwise. It's really very, very much applied, right? And it's really focusing on specific issues. And because most of you uh, are probably becoming teachers, we thought that we would uh, include it uh, in, the, uh, in the course. In week 11, we're going to have a look at corpus linguistics, which is a very uh, interesting and growing field, uh, especially when it comes to learner corpus research, 
uh, language uh, learning and teaching and so on. So we're going to work with corpus tools and we're going to talk about what is corpus linguistics and how can you use it in your own research. In week 12, we're going to have a look at experimentation surveys and questionnaires. What do you need to consider? What are key components of experimental research? What do you need to do when you want to design your own uh, surveys and questionnaires? And in week 13, basically, that's a roundup session where we bas basically just reflect on what we've done over the, over the semester. And we also give you an outlook of uh, where you can basically uh, tap into specific um, aspects and learn more about uh, different areas that we've touched on and introduced in this course. All right. So one thing that's very important for students, of course, are the assessments in this course. Uh, we have four assessments in this course. Uh, the first are online study tasks. Uh, they are worth uh, 20%. So there are 10 um, online study tasks. They start in week three and they end in week 12. So there's 10 of them, right? And each of these 10 uh, tasks consists out of 10 questions, it's typically multiple choice questions or short answer um, items. And they are intended to prepare you for the week. So the due date of each of these online study tasks is the Monday 1 p.m. of the week for which that task is intended. So the due date for the week three assessment is the Monday of week three, right? Because we want you to basically have engaged with the resources, the lecture and the readings before you come to the tutorials, right? So. That is basically what we want to do there. We want to basically encourage you and make sure that you've engaged with the resources that we've made available to you. Then in week eight, as I uh, just said, we are having a session on research ethics and academic integrity. And so um, from week onwards, there will be an online module that you need to take to pass this course. This is separate from the university's uh, academic integrity and research ethics module. So even if you might have done the university or has wide um, research ethics module, you still need to do uh, the module for this course. And you have an infinite number, unlimited number of um, approaches, right? Um, but you need to pass it uh, before the end of week 13. Then we have an annotated bibliography presentation. There we want you to basically find two research articles on the topic of your choosing. We want you to summarize the research articles and also then compare and evaluate them, right? And it's a 10 minute presentation. So you have about three minutes for each uh, of the two articles and then another three to four minutes in the critical evaluation. And finally, the big assessment that's worth 50% of your final grade uh, is the research proposal, where we want you to come up with your own idea of um, a study that you then present um, as a proposal, right? And the due date there is week 15. Just a final word on the online study tasks. Uh, it's really important that you don't play around with them. So once you start uh, or click on begin, um, for each of these online study tasks, you have only 60 minutes to complete it, right? So you can basically uh, start it and check the questions and then uh, basically submit it later. Once you start it, you have to basically answer the questions and submit it within 60 minutes. So that's something that you have to pay attention to. If you um, have unstable connection, um, please go somewhere where you can basically be certain that your uh, answers will be submitted within 60 uh, minutes. Again, if you want to have more information about the task descriptions or the rubrics for each of the assessments, they're all on uh, UQ Learn Blackboard. So the assessments either test your knowledge of the course content or they give you an opportunity to apply the skills that you've acquired in this course um, to relative re uh, relevant research tasks. So it's really that we want to use these assessments to prepare you for the week or to basically give you an opportunity to apply what you've learned. What I would highly recommend is that you make a note of the assessment deadlines in your calendar um, because you're really uh, expected to submit them on time. Uh, please don't submit late because then we have to uh, deduce points from your um, from the points that you've achieved. Now, if you have any questions, the first thing to do is to check the ECP and Blackboard. Um, most of the questions that you'll have you'll find answers to uh, on the ECP, or you'll find resources relevant to your question on Blackboard. 
Um, you can also post general questions in the course Padlet uh, that's also linked to on UQ Learn Blackboard. Also, we encourage peer support. Um, so if you know the answer, feel free to help your fellow students. And if you don't know an answer, feel free to ask your fellow students, right? Because most of the questions you can actually answer yourselves. Um, the teaching team, including myself, will be monitoring the um, board, so the Padlet, um, to see if any questions pop up, right? You can also send an email to your lecturer for personal matters or specific questions. Um, again, the information uh, and email addresses are on Blackboard. Finally, you can book individual consultations for inquiries that need in-depth uh, discussion or where you don't want to share that with anyone, right? So please feel free to get in touch should there be anything specific. All right. So about the course, uh, you should have learned by now that uh, UQ Blackboard or uh, sorry, UQ Learn Blackboard is where you can find the resources for this course, right? So you'll find resources, including task descriptions, rubrics, uh, readings, uh, information and links to assessments, announcements that will also be sent to you by email. So you need to check your UQ email. Um, we will not send any information to your private email. It's only to your UQ email. And also you'll find information about how to get in touch with us, right? So let's have a look. Uh, just give me a moment. Um, I want to uh, stop here real quick. All right, I've turned on my student preview mode um, for myself because I, and also the lecturers uh, and tutors in this course, they have a different view of what you can see. Right. So if you look, uh, look to the left, you'll see that you have announcements, uh, the course profile, uh, course staff, course help, learning resources, assessment, discussion board, my grades and library links. So when we send any announcement, um, we check, we uh, tick a checkbox um, that basically also sends the uh, announcement to you by email. Right. But also, if you want to make sure that you got it and want to have an overview of the different announcements, you'll find them in the announcements folder. Um, if you want to have a look at the um, course profile, you click on course profile and then you'll, you'll be able to um, see the course profile where you find all the information. So basic information about the course, course aims and objectives, learning resources for each week. Learning activities uh, here, for example, you'll see what we do in each week, right? You'll also see the learn uh, the readings that are required um, about the assessments. You find lots of information here about assessments, including uh, task descriptions um, and rubrics. Uh, also, the grading system, and you find information about um, how to apply for an extension. That's very important because if you cannot submit uh, on time. You need to apply for an extension uh, before the due date. And you can't just simply send me an email. You have to really uh, request an extension, right? So that's actually how you apply for extension. And then you have some other um, things here that are not super important. It's just the policies and guidelines and the learning summary. All right. Let me go back to the presentation. Okay, before we go back to the presentation, we go back to UQ Learn, of course, right? So um, here, the most important uh, thing, well, before we do the important thing, this is just how you can uh, access uh, the people who are associated with this course. I need to update that because TRA needs to be in here. Um, and these were people who've uh, taught into this course before, but here you can find my information and you'll also find um, TRA's information. Um, then you can go to um, learning resources. That's really the key component because here you'll see that for each week, there's actually a folder. And in that folder, you'll find uh, information that's relevant for uh, a specific uh, week, right? So here, basically, you'll find information for week one uh, for the orientation. And here I worked on week 10, so I'll make that unavailable in a little bit. Um, the way that works is that we'll make everything available um, relevant for week two in week one. So basically, we're always one week ahead of where you need to be, right? So you still have lots of time um, for um, basically accessing uh, the different um, 
uh, assessments or different readings and so on, right? In the assessment folder, uh, you'll find, for example, uh, the links, um, because uh, there is no task uh, yet for you, uh, basically you won't see anything there, right? But once uh, the, um, the online task is available, which is one week ahead of time, right? Then you'll be able to see the link and then uh, take the online study task. And for example, do the research ethics and academic um, integrity online module and so on, right? So um, basically these will be available um, in time for you, but that's how you can find the links to the different uh, assessments. Right, let me now go back to the presentation. All right, so we just had a look at Blackboard and you'll also do that in the tutorial, all right? So that's what I wanted to talk to you about um, with respect to the course. So what is academic research? So here, um, basically I wanted to give you just a um, definition. So research is an organized and methodological inquiry carried out to provide information about sol uh, information for solving problems or answering questions. So the important thing here that it's organized and it's methodological. It's not just haphazard. It has to follow a certain protocol and it's there to basically solve problems or answer questions. It is the cornerstone of all science and it consists of a systematic process of collecting and analyzing information to increase our understanding of the world in general or phenomena uh, under inquiry in particular. So here I wanted to stress that it's really a systematic process, right? It's the cornerstone of all science. So whenever you do science, whenever you do, uh, when you want to analyze anything or study anything, research is really at the core of that, right? And it can be about fundamental issues that are pretty much there to understand the world around us, right? Or they can be there to uh, answer specific research questions or basically analyze specific phenomena. So that's one definition of research. And I think it's a quite comprehensive and good one. Now there are different forms of research, right? You could differentiate between different forms of research in various ways, right? But I think uh, that there are two ways how you can distinguish research or classify it in different categories, which is empir uh, empirical versus theoretical or formal research. And empirical research, as in biology, psychology, applied linguistics, uses data. So when you do empirical research, you actually work with data. Data can be different things. It can be texts, it can be transcripts, it can be experiments, it can be surveys, but it's something that you uh, collect or that's already collected that you use to answer a research question, right? So that's empirical research. It's uh, basically used to um, answer research questions using some form of data. And then there's theoretical or formal research, uh, which uses logic and thinking um, to answer research questions or answer questions, right? Um, so for example, when you think about uh, logic, it's basically how, how do you arrive at uh, statements, true statements by following certain procedures. And then you don't need data, it's really just how to arrive at a true statement based on certain premises. And then you have to follow certain um, uh, procedures that allow you to arrive at true statements. Also in mathematics, uh, there you oftentimes actually do not need data. You just basically uh, work with formula, right? That would be theoretical or formal. So the, the first def uh, differentiation is between empirical versus theoretical and formal research. The second type of uh, distinction can be made between explore, uh, explanatory and exploratory and descriptive. So on the one hand, you have explanatory, which is really used to explain something, a phenomenon, like why is this occurring? And uh, the second uh, type is exploratory. You basically have a, um, a phenomenon and you want to basically understand it and describe it, right? So explanatory is typically tied to hypothesis testing. So you have basically a question you, and then you test whether the answer you have in mind is correct or not. Right And exploratory is more, you don't really have a specific question or hypothesis, you want to basically find out or describe what is there, 
right? So explanatory research tests specific ideas while uh, exploratory and descriptive research simply try to explore and detail what is there. There are also many different uh, types of research that can be grouped within these basic forms or categories of research. So for example, in the tutorial, you'll basically have a look at different types of research. Um, and they can be grouped within the categories that I've um, proposed here. Then uh, why I, I stressed in the definition that research has to be methodological, right, or systematic. And the question is why, right? And the answer to that is errare humanum est, which means um, humans err, right? Or um, basically being wrong is part of the human condition. And we err or we are wrong um, all the time, and we are not evolved to understand the world as it really is. It just happens to be the case that ancestors have survived and procreated um, who had a certain cognitive makeup, right? And so, for example, uh, people who basically were better at recognizing patterns, right, they could uh, avoid, for example, certain illnesses uh, or certain uh, predators better than people who weren't able to make uh, connections and see patterns, which is why we are very good at recognizing patterns. Maybe we're too good at recognizing patterns, right? But that just means that basically uh, we did not evolve to see the world as it really is. It's just the way that uh, people survived who had the ability to recognize patterns and who had certain other capabilities. And that's basically why our cognitive apparatus uh, and perceptual apparatus is the way it is, right? Um, the problem is that we have certain cognitive and emotional biases, and they actually lead us astray um, from seeing the world as it is, right? And now the methods and protocols that we have developed uh, that are part of the scientific method, they are there to counter these biases, right? And one of the biases that I mentioned here was uh, seeing patterns, right? And if you have a look at these uh, three circles with uh, the... Uh, or these three Pac-Man, <laughs> so uh, these three symbols there, you basically won't see anything, right? It's just basically circles and uh, there's a triangle missing from them, right? But if we have a look at um, the next pattern, now it's that we, most of you would see that there's a triangle in the center, right? The triangle is actually not there. There is no triangle, but our cognitive apparatus and perceptual apparatus basically is very good at detecting patterns. And we take hints um, based on our prior experience and prior knowledge of the world. And that allows us to see patterns in the input, right? So while we didn't see any pattern before, now we can actually see that there's a pattern, which is a triangle, right? And the point I wanted to make here is that basically we interpret the way around us in certain ways. And uh, the way that we interpret the world is um, by seeing patterns, by making connections, although there might actually not be a real pattern, right? Another uh, point that I want to make here is related to um, a ball and a bat. So there you see a table tennis racket and a ball. And the question is, assume that a ball and a bat together cost $1.10. The bet costs $1 more than the ball. What does the ball cost, right? So most of you or most people, my, myself included, if we were to answer very, very quickly to that question, you would say, well, um, the ball costs 10 cents, right? But that doesn't work because if the ball costs 10 cents and the bet is $1 more than the ball, then it would cost $1.10 and then together it would be $1.20, right? which is wrong because together they cost $1.10, not $1.20. So the correct answer is the ball costs five cent, then $1 more is $1.05, and together that's $1.10. Now, what I wanted to uh, show here is that we have a way of dealing with numbers that is oftentimes intuitive, right? So um, when we answer questions, we often go with our gut feeling. And it's, it's not only with numbers, it's with many things, right? Um, but what we try to do in research is we try not to believe our gut feeling and uh, not to believe our intuition, but really to systematically analyze the answer, 
right? And that's what we basically did when we thought about, well, what can be the cost of the ball if together it's $1.10, right? So we actually also bet with numbers, right? And we tend to go with gut feeling rather than systematic inquiry. And science forces us to basically neglect our intuition and then go with a systematic and more detailed analysis. All right, here's another thing that I wanted to share with you, right? So imagine you are presented with cards that have letters on one side and numbers on the other, right? So four of these cards are placed on a table before you. Card one is an A, card two is a K, card three is a two, and the fourth card is a seven. You are told that whenever a vowel, so A, I, O, U, and E, uh, whenever there's a vowel on one side of the card, the other side is an even number. Which of these four cards would you have to turn over to determine whether this rule holds true? So I want you to have a look at the cards. Okay, let's go over uh, the thing. So most students typically answer uh, card one and two, right? And card one is correct, right? So if we turn over card one and there's not an even number, then we know that the statement is false, right? But uh, our statement does not say anything about consonants, right? So if we turn over uh, card two, we don't learn anything. It's unrelated to the question that we had or to the statement that we want to test. The statement being that when there's a vowel on one side, there's an even number on the other. So card two is actually irrelevant, right? Now, card three uh, is actually also uh, not really necessary, right? Because we said when there's a vowel on the one, one side, there's an even number on the other, but it doesn't say when there's an even number, right? There has to be a vowel. So it could also be that when there's an even number, it can also be a consonant, right? It can also be another number. We only told that when there's a vowel on the one hand, there has to be uh, an even number on the other. Card four is relevant because if we turn over card four and there's a vowel, then we also learn something. Then we also know that the statement is false, right? So the cards that we have to turn around are actually card one and card four. All right. Now, one of the most important concepts in at least empirical research is falsification. And falsification goes back to um, Karl Raimund Popper. So he was an Austrian uh, philosopher of science. He can be considered the most important philosopher of science um, because he laid the groundwork of understanding how science or modern science were, right? And he showed that empirical science, in the empirical sciences, we never prove anything. So you don't prove, you only falsify, right? So you can only prove in formal or theoretical sciences, not in the empirical sciences, right? Uh, I'll explain to you why that's the case. You never prove, right? You, all, you only falsify. And he also showed that all our knowledge is preliminary and probabilistic. So what we know now has to be able to change um, if we get new information that contradicts what we think we know now, right? So everything that we know now has to be, um, could be potentially wrong, right? So it's probabilistic, it's not absolute. It's basically, we have to basically see the world as a model or our understanding of the world as a model that we update if we get new information that contradicts our model. Now, Raymond Popper claimed, uh, Raymond Popper claimed that uh, sciences work through falsification. So, for example, no number of observations that something can confirm a scientific uh, theory would be sufficient because a single counter example can show that it's false or wrong, right? So, for example, if I have the claim all swans are white, no matter how many white swans I show uh, makes that statement true, right? We just show that basically we confirm uh, the statement, but basically it's cherry picking. It's only looking for things that confirm your hypothesis or your statement. What's really necessary is that you don't look for white swans, you look for black swans, because a single black swan actually suffices to show that the statement is wrong, right? 
So it's also much more economic uh, to basically not look for all the white swans, right? It's much more economic to look for that one black swan that falsifies a claim, right? So no matter how many white swans I have that confirm a claim, a single black swan can falsify it. Now, it's important to understand that if something is falsifiable, it doesn't mean that it's false or wrong or fake, right? It simply means that it can, at least in principle, be shown to be false by observation or by an experiment, right? So falsification means that something can be shown to be wrong, right? So you have true statements, but they are falsifiable because if we had evidence to the contrary, then basically that um, observation or that statement would be shown to be wrong. Right. Although if we don't have that evidence yet, it's preliminary. We have to assume that it is true. According to Popper, falsifiability as is the, really the defining criterion of what is and what is not science. So if something is not falsifiable, uh, it cannot be a considered sci scientific. Right. So uh, falsifiability is really the key criterion of what is what is science. All right, so here I have two basically depictions of, of, of circles, right? And they represent the scientific circle in different on different levels of abstraction, right? Typically, when we want to analyze something, we'll make an observation, something that startles us. For example, uh, I've lost my keys. So the observation would be, I lost my keys, right? Then I can basically... Um, think about or carry um, uh, think about where I lost my key right and then form uh, a hypothesis or a model of the world where my key is right maybe for example last night I fell asleep on the sofa and that's where the keys rolled out of my pocket right and then from that model from that hypothesis I can derive a specific hypothesis that I want to test right? In my case, the hypothesis could be, oh, my key must be on my sofa because when I fell asleep, it rolled out of my pocket, right? Then I test my hypothesis by um, checking the sofa. And then if my key is there, basically I have success. And now I can, my hypothesis basically confirmed and um, it's, it's good right? Uh, we can stop. But if the key is not there, right, then I have another observation, which is my key is not in my pocket. The key is not on the sofa. I now have to create another model, right? For example, maybe uh, the key is actually on the table in the kitchen, right? Because that's where I might put my keys, right? And then I can, from that uh, model that I've induced, right? So from observation to basically abstract to form a model would be induction. And then you derive a hypothesis from that model, from that idea, right? So then basically you can form a model that says, oh, it must be on the table in the kitchen. You reduce, you deduce the hypothesis, oh, um, the key must be on the table in the kitchen. You test it by going into the kitchen and checking whether the key is there. And evaluation, either it's, uh, I found my keys, then it's all good, or it's not there. And then I have another observation and I form a model and so on, right? So that's basically uh, the scientific circle. You make an observation, you form uh, a model or an explanation, you deduce a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and then you evaluate the hypothesis, whether it was true or not, right? Now, on a more uh, down-to-earth level, uh, that's focusing on a specific research project, you can say that you start with choosing a topic, right? You might be interested in something. Um, for example, how does my mother or my, my first language affect uh, my ability to learn another language, right? Then you can think about the method that you want to use to, to analyze that topic, right? And then you do some reading about, you know, uh, your topic. For example, you know, how does your L1 affect your, L, your um, L2? You collect some data, you analyze the data, and you do the write-up, right? And then you choose another topic. So the first uh, circle here with observation, induction, dedu induction, deduction, testing, and evaluation is more about the scientific process, right? And the second part is more about how actually if you um, if you want to write a study how that works so first choose a topic think about methods 
do research, uh, uh, do reading for your research, collect data, analyze data, and writing up. So that would basically be for a specific study, right? So the left circle is more abstract and the right circle is more uh, concrete. So if you want to know more about uh, research that's going on in the school, um, you can actually have a look at what types of research or what projects people are involved in and learn more about research that's going on within our school by going to uh, the school website and just checking out the our research um, sections, right? You'll see that there's research in linguistics and second language studies, in studies and culture and in uh, translating and interpreting, right? And you'll find information about the projects and also people who are involved in these different clusters. So that's pretty much it, just as an uh, idea for next week. Next week, we'll be learning more about conceptualizing a research project, right? So what do you need to consider? How do you get started? And so on, right? So um, final thing for me to say is have a great week, everyone, and see you in the tutorials. All right. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. That was me, Martin, and I hope you have a fantastic week.